The Philharmonic BMR, this is a V2. Mini monitor, bookshelf sized speaker. This is a design by Dennis Murphy. Retail price is around $1,800 to $2,000, depending on what finish you get. Now, I don't know where this particular one sits in price. This actually came from the owner. So shout out to the owner for loaning me the speaker for review. He was interested in seeing what the data would show and curious about maybe what I thought I heard as well. So that's how I got these speakers. They came directly from the owner and they just look gorgeous. Now this uses a six inch mid woofer from SB Acoustics, a tectonic two and a half inch balanced mode radiator for the mid range, and then the RAL ribbon tweeter at the top. And honestly, for the price, now I, I know that the BMR isn't that expensive. Um, I haven't looked, but it's probably in that like $20 to $30 region. And it, it may be a little bit more, but it's not much more. The SB Acoustic 6-inch woofers aren't too terribly expensive. Again, I haven't checked the price. Somebody can go and look at it for me if they want to, but I'm going to say they're around maybe $100 to $150 each. And it, that may be overshooting it a little bit. But the Rowl Ribbon Tweeter is definitely on the more expensive side. So you combine up the drivers with the overall cabinet aesthetic and the solidity of the cabinet. And honestly, I don't know how Dennis is making any money. I'd be surprised if he's making much at all. And then you factor in the time that it takes to go and build this and, and have it all set up. Then the crossover components. Yeah, I don't know. This is a, a really good deal. But in terms of what I thought about the sound, there's a few things that stood out and I really want to kind of hit on those in this review. Now, I did review the V1 of this speaker about two years ago, and there were a couple things about that particular speaker that stood out to me. Overall, I thought it was a great speaker, but on the more maybe negative side of things, one in particular was the tweeter level. The tweeter level to me was just a little bit too hot and in room, it kind of plateaued out, which I, would, I didn't really care for. Uh, the soundstage width was awesome though, and I just love that. Now this particular speaker doesn't have that issue with the high frequency. And when I say issue, understand that it was an issue to me. But now that issue doesn't exist. And the in-room response is really just, it's really, really good, except for, and this is really the only caveat with this particular speaker, the two to three kilohertz region. When I was listening to various music, music I've listened to forever, that two to three kilohertz region, there was some glare in certain voices and guitars, some, some strings just didn't sound right. And I'll give you one. Joe Walsh's Life's Been Good. Uh, the opening guitar riff, far on the left, really good, just outside the speaker in terms of width. But there's a lot of glare to that guitar, and I just didn't like it. Now, some of that, some of it, some of it is on the recording. And you can verify that easily by just pulling up an audacity, plotting the spectrum, and you can see it, right? So it's not all bad, but the glare that I heard was more pronounced than I would have cared for. And as I continue to go through tracks, I continue to have that same observation. That was the one thing that stood out to me. And then when I looked at the data, I understood what I was hearing. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The point that I really want to get across though, is that while the radiation of the speaker is very, very wide, and it provides a really wide soundstage and just something that I really adore in a speaker. The fallback of that is you typically have more diffuseness in the focus and placement of images within the soundstage. So let's say that you've got a violinist over here and then you've got a vocalist at the center of the soundstage. I'm making stuff up right now. With Speakers that have, generally speaking, with speakers that have a more narrow radiation, the placement for those vocalists, instruments, etc., are going to be pretty well defined. But with speakers that have a broader radiation, there's a little bit of muddiness, some little bit of a blurriness to them. So you can't point and say, here's the vocalist and here's the instrument right here. It's a little bit ambiguous. And that was the one thing that I noticed about this speaker as well as it, yes, it was a little bit ambiguous. Now that was listening in my home theater room when I took them downstairs into my living room, which is a much larger space, much larger open floor plan. There's only one wall next to the speaker as far as side walls go, but the right speaker where there is no wall is open up into uh, 
I guess the dining room and the foyer. And I think because of that, there was less sidewall reflection in that room. And that led to me being able to localize and pinpoint particular instruments and place them about the soundstage much more easily than I could in my home theater where the, the room is more narrow. I think it's like 16 or 17 feet wide. And the speakers are about three feet away from the sidewalls on each side. So I think that there's kind of that additional room reflection going on off the sidewall. And I think that's what was causing me to not be able to precisely point to images within the sound stage. So that's the fallback of having a very wide speaker in radiation terms. A speaker that has a more narrow radiation, generally speaking, is going to be able to uh, precisely pinpoint and place instruments and things like that among the sound stage. So that's kind of the difference there. The other thing about this particular speaker is at a sensitivity of around 86 dB, I think, um, it's, it's a good average sensitivity, but this woofer doesn't really have a lot of guts to give you a lot of output. And when I'm talking a lot of output, what I mean to say is most people in most listening situations, let's say three to four meters at around 80 to 85 dB on average in terms of SPL are probably going to be okay. And that's most people listening points. That, that's kind of what I've taken away from feedback that I've gotten. When I push the speaker harder, because people want to know, when I push the speaker harder and got it to like 95 dB at about four meters for the pair in the room, that's when they started to give up a little bit. And the woofers started to say, I, I can't do this anymore. I can't keep up. And in terms of that output, the low frequency response I'd say the roll off in the room was around 50 Hertz or so. Now there's going to be a little bit of give and take there. And obviously your room is going to factor in as far as where you place the speaker, the size of your room, et cetera. But in my home theater and in my living room, I'd say you're looking at about an average of around 50 Hertz in room response before the response starts to roll off a little bit. And you're wanting to add a subwoofer for most music. That's probably going to be okay. But I mentioned this because some of you out there, like to listen to music at louder volumes, or you might want to try to use these as a cross between a home theater and a stereo setup, and you still will definitely need a subwoofer, but I don't think that's really going to surprise you. In my listening, I also noticed what I thought was a, a mild resonance, and at first, in my home theater, I thought it was around like 250 to 300 hertz, and I wrote that down in my notes, and then I listened in my listening room, and I still heard a resonance, but it didn't seem like it was as low. So I wasn't quite able to pinpoint where it was. And I thought, well, maybe it's the room. Maybe there's something going on with each room. You just don't know. So after I did my listening, I put the speaker on the stand and then I measured it with my clipple near field scanner, got full anechoic data. And from that data, I was able to extract about where a resonance occurs. And it looks like there's some kind of resonance around 500 Hertz. And I don't see this in the impedance data, but what I do see in the horizontal data on axis and off axis is a stacking up of the response curves around that area. So that kind of indicates to me that there's something going on. Now, whether that is what I heard or not, I'm not very confident in, but I do feel it's worthwhile to mention these things to you because it's something that if somebody out there owns these speakers or buys these speakers and hears the same sound and they're curious, maybe I'm giving you enough information to go on and we can kind of hone in on where exactly that issue is. And now I wanna flip over into the data and we'll talk about that a little bit more. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is the CEA 2034 data. And overall, you see some pretty good directivity curves, except for the sound power does show an issue around 500 Hertz, which is what I was talking about previously. There is a little bit of an increase in output between maybe like 300 to that 500 Hertz region, give or take. So you can see a little bit of a mid-range to lower mid-range imbalance there in terms of overall level. There is some diffraction that we see around three kilohertz and that's evidenced by the on-axis response dipping down relative to the listening window in green. Now, if we go look at the overall linearity and sensitivity of the speaker, I measure the speaker to be about 84.1 dB and that's anechoic, 2.83 volts, one meter. You can see at the bottom, that the horizontal directivity is not quite linear. There is again that, that weirdness around 500 Hertz and you are increasing in horizontal directivity until about two kilohertz. 
when you switch over and you kind of go back down a little bit. So there is a little bit of a directivity mismatch in that area. And now we're gonna look at the estimated in room response. So if I draw a trend line through here, you can kind of see what I was talking about earlier. There is a little bit of a rise from about 300 Hertz to 500 Hertz by about maybe like a DB or two. And then you get it around to two to three kilohertz and you see another DB, two DB bump in that particular reason. And that's where I think that glare was coming from in vocals and guitar. And then there is some evidence of sibilance in the six kilohertz region. That's not anything that I noticed in my listening, but honestly, I think I was pretty thrown off by that two to three kilohertz region. And I kind of quit listening for the sibilance that just, I focused more on that two to three kilohertz glare. Now let's look at the horizontal dispersion and you can see here where we're saying the speaker radiates at about plus or minus 70 degrees to about plus or minus 80 degrees. That means it's a very wide radiating speaker. It's gonna illuminate the side walls. It will sound very enveloping. You're gonna have a very wide sound stage. And those are all things that I generally love. But I would say that if you have a small room, a very reflective room, then it might not be the best choice for you. You may want to consider going with a speaker that has more narrow radiation or make sure that you use a good bit, in my opinion, a good bit, maybe like four inches worth of some acoustic uh, paneling on the side walls. I have two inch acoustic paneling on the side wall and it still wasn't enough to get rid of the diffusivity of these speakers. So that's why I say maybe four inches would do more. Now, these are all anecdotal things, right? So I'm not saying that my word is gospel here. This is just information that I'm trying to provide you to help you make a better purchase decision and maybe understand what you're getting into. So take that for what it's worth and I'm just trying to help. In terms of output, let's just jump straight to the 96 dB distortion. I will have 86 dB on my website. I'm gonna save some time, look at 96 dB. You can see that the speaker is limited in output via higher distortion in the lower frequencies, but the mid-range frequencies and above are all good. So there's no issues of tweeter stress or mid-range stress. It's really all in the mid-woofer. And honestly, I'm not surprised by that at all. SB Acoustics tends to overrate their linear excursion of their mid-woofers, probably actually all of their speakers, if I'm being honest, by almost twice as much as I get using the Clipple. And the Clipple, when I say that, I also have other Clipple products that measure linear excursion, which is when the woofer or mid-range or whatever I'm testing, the raw drive unit reaches a point where it has 10% distortion or more, that's where you define the linear excursion. And typically, and I'm, I'm gonna make up a number here, typically SB Acoustics might say six millimeters, and I find that number to be more like three millimeters. So I'm not really surprised to see that the woofer is ramping up in distortion and exceeding 3% THD even at 100 Hertz. And then we flip over to the compression data. Now this compression data for the red and the blue looks okay. The red and the blue represent a deviation in response as you increase the volume from 76 dBs to 86 dB and then 96 dB. That kind of gives you an idea of what the dynamic range capability of the speaker might be. But if you look at the purple, that would be the next step up to 102 dB. And the purple shows some serious compression going on with this particular speaker. Notably in the mid-woofer region, you can see you're going down uh, two and a half dB at about 120 Hertz. Then you're picking back up. So basically what's going on here is the woofer is unloading inside the cabinet. On the high end though, we also see that the RAL ribbon tweeter is also suffering a lot of compression at that higher volume. And it's basically falling off the map here. I mean, you're below three dB at 10 kilohertz and then it kind of picks back up a little bit from there. Overall, I think really what this is telling us is that it verifies what I heard in room that this speaker isn't really gonna do the job for very, very high output, unless maybe you put a proper crossover on the midwoofer. But if you're using this strictly for two channel and you're wanting to listen at high, high volume, and I would say high volumes, maybe like above 90 dB at four meters, then consider that. And that's it for this review. I hope you learned something. I hope you appreciate it. Overall, I would say it's a gorgeous looking speaker. Really good sound overall, but be mindful of the radiation and the combination of your room. If you happen to have a couple bands of EQ handy, you can really do some wonders on this speaker. 
Uh, if you don't, then it's still a perfectly fine speaker. But like I said, there were a couple minor areas in the frequency response that kind of bothered me personally speaking. So keep that in mind if you're shopping for this speaker or other speakers. And if you have the opportunity to hear the speaker, I would be interested to know what you think. Please leave a comment below. With all of that said, I am out. I do want to shout out my patrons for all their support and helping me keep this thing moving. So if you would like to join my Patreon channel, that would be cool. I'll have a link in the description below. But other than that, I will talk to you all later and see y'all on the next review. Peace.